It, it is all breaking up so oh. we can we can hear every third word and it's not where it's just like it was just last not week not good. can you hear me yeah yeah so i still think there's this problem with the the room with its own miking and then with the special microphone that's not not coming through on Zoom. If you turn off the mic and and try to work through the room and talk, maybe that will work. kind of process.
It's coming to me. It's very Anything? Wait, because now it's starting to light on. Don't mind white Back here. Uh, We can do just a computer and get the top just to the slides here. Here, just get a microphone. No, microphone here. Yeah. You can oh, yeah, just like a senator here. Just share from here. Share. Share. <laughs> Can you hear me? Connected with a Zoom, can you hear me better? Or not so much? There is no sound on the Zoom watch. If you want, you can book this and I connect it to the microphone. The other one should be the other one. So now it is unmuted. They should hear you now. Can you, can, you yeah. okay, um, can you hear me now better? Yes, I can hear you better. It's still not. Okay, so let's do this. Yeah. All right. Don't worry about it. All right. Thank you. We had a little technical difficulties, but uh, okay. This is the first slide. Thanks. All right, let's start. Uh, so uh, I'm Jehan Lee, I'm an associate professor in the mining department. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, bio leaching. So I make a, made a title, uh, Fundamentals and Application of Biotechnology and uh, Extractive Metallurgy. But, uh, it's 
it's naturally about bio leaching station and other. So what is biohydrometallurgy? And maybe some of you heard about that, and maybe uh, many of you never heard about it. So biohydrometallurgy is just two words combined: biotechnology or bio and, and hydrometallurgy. So uh, in uh, <clears throat> the definition is use of microorganisms, some specific microorganism for the oxidation of a sulfide mineral. So we can extract, let's say, copper from copper sulfide or zinc from uh, zinc sulfide, or we can also uh, <clears throat> uh, get rid of pyrite or sulfide minerals uh, for the uh, downstream process. So the precious metal, gold is associated with a pyrite. Sometimes gold is locked in the inside of pyrite. So actually we need to get rid of those pyrite. So that's what we call the bio-oxidation. So biohydrometallurgy is bio leaching or bio oxidation. Typically, we deal with the uh, refractory material. So refractory means to the metallurgist, it's a servant <clears throat> to a tech, chemical attack. So in one example is, let's say, cobalite, chalcopyrite, those uh, primary sulfide, it's very difficult to extract the copper using conventional chemicals such as sulfuric acid. If it is copper oxide, such as cuprite, dinoride, uh, crystal cola, we can use sulfuric acid to extract the copper very easily. But uh, sulfide, we call the refractory, <clears throat> it's difficult to, uh, to extract the copper out of the sulfide. So biohydrometallurgy can be an alternative process. Uh, of, uh, I mean, instead of uh, sending to smelter or pressure oxidation, or roasting, so it could be an alternative process, but <clears throat> the bio process cannot compete against uh, smelting or pressure oxidation in a large quantity. So if you have enough material, you better send it to uh, the conventional process, but the smaller amount or the low grade or there are special uh, situation, we can use this biotechnology. So I put some uh, formula, bio, Oxidation. So, what the biooxidation mean is mineral leaching of acid insoluble minerals such as pyrite, molybdenite, and and so on. So, if you put those material in an acid free acid solution, <clears throat> that doesn't. I mean, they don't dissolve in the solution. Okay. So, it's a solubilized by ferric ion using Fe three plus in the solution. So, we can. Uh, dissolve those metals. We can oxidize those metals. So in the intermediate form, as you can see in this uh, slide, so pyrite reacted with the uh, iron, ferric iron, and it's going to form thiosulfate. That's two or three, two minus is a thiosulfate. And then that Fe3 plus becomes Fe2 plus. So ferric reduced to ferrous. And then thiosulfate will be further uh, oxidized by the ferric ion. It's going to form sulfate, SO4 two minus. Sulfate is at the end of the uh, sulfur oxidation state. So we oxidize the sulfide from pyrite <clears throat> to all the way to sulfate. And then thiosulfate further uh, reacted in the form of element of sulfur and a, and a uh, sulfide. But uh, the key thing is, Pyrite will be oxidized by the ferric, and ferric will reduce to uh, ferrous. So that's a bio oxidation. Yeah, go ahead. Basically, an acid mine break. Exactly. So we, I'll, I'm not going to talk about much about acid rock drainage, but yeah, essentially, it's a bio oxidation, it's an acid rock drainage. And the next term is bio leaching. So, bio leaching is so what it says, mineral leaching of acid-soluble minerals, such as uh, lead sulfide uh, and then zinc sulfide, manganese, and the copper sulfide. So if we have acid, these material can be dissolved. So we can have a lead, zinc, manganese, and copper in, a, in an aqueous uh, solution. So solubilized by the uh, action, the combined action of a ferric ion 
and an acid. And then during that process, you could release H2S gas. So one example is zinc sulfide spherulite reacted with the uh, ferric ion and also uh, H plus S acid. And zinc 2 plus cation will be formed and H2S to polysulfide. And again, Fe3 plus become Fe2 plus. Okay. And then other reaction could happen. So biooxidation is only for the sulfide, such as pyrite. But bioleaching is we oxidize the sulfide, and at the same time, we have the uh, value metal in the solution. Okay, so if it is zinc sulfide, we have the zinc. If it is copper sulfide, it, we get to get the uh, copper in the solution. And then also, I mentioned Fe three plus is going to form to. I mean, Fe three plus is going to reduce to Fe two plus. And how do we get those Fe two plus? Back to Fe three plus. That's a, one of the bio uh, uh, reaction in the microbial system. So this slide summarizes those two things. So you have a metal sulfide, and it's leached by the ferric ion. So ferric ion leached the uh, metal sulfide, and it's going to uh, reduce the uh, Fe two plus. And the metal sulfide, we're going to have a metal cation and a thiosulfate or H two S. And then also this Fe3 plus and oxygen further oxidized all the sulfide um, sulfur complex all the way to sulfate and uh, hydrogen ion. And little intermediate is a little different, but at the end, we have a sulfate ion and hydrogen uh, H plus ion proton. So the big difference is, as I said, uh, whether that hydrogen uh, ion, the proton, will be used to extract the metal or not. So this hydrogen ion is going to be I mean, used to leach that metal, then it's a bio-leaching. In other words, we call it polysulfide mechanism, but if that proton cannot be used to uh, extract the metal, then we call it the thiosulfate mechanism. So this is a bio-oxidation, particularly uh, uh, using a precious metal uh, application. So to achieve the uh, good leaching, good extraction, metal extraction, we have to have appropriate solution condition, whether we need a, a sulfuric acid for the copper, uh, we need a cyanide for the gold, and then, I mean, many other different applications. We have to have good solution conditions. And the contacting of a leaching agent and a mineral. So we have those chemicals and the mineral had to be well mixed and uh, they had a good uh, contact to extract an adequate mass transfer. So mass transfer uh, diffusion to supplying the, uh, the reagent is important. And a regeneration of the leaching agent. So in a, in a simple chemical reaction system, if you use a sulfuric acid to extract the copper, acid will be consumed. Acid will be consumed by uh, copper extraction and also reaction reacted with the uh, gang mineral. So how do we do, how do we maintain the acid concentration? We have to keep uh, supplying that chemical. But in the, uh, one of the advantage of the bio uh, leaching, bio oxidation system, most, I mean, all those key uh, the reagent can be regenerated, such as Fe3 plus and H plus. So you will use the iron oxidizing microorganism and also sulfur oxidizing microorganism, so we can regenerate uh, iron and uh, hydrogen, I mean, iron and uh, acid. So how do we regenerate? How does, how do our microorganisms regenerate those agents? This is, as I said, Fe3 plus regeneration, ferric iron regeneration, using iron oxidizing microorganism. So in the previous slide, a pyrite, will be oxidized by the ferric ion, and the ferric ion becomes ferricide, Fe2+. Plus. And Fe2+, plus is gonna react with an oxygen in an acidic solution, and it's gonna form a uh, ferric ion. So this reaction happens naturally, but the kinetic is very, very slow. So without any microbial activity, it happens, but not fast enough to uh, 
provide this very high. So that's why we use specific microorganism and oxidize the ferrous ion to a ferric ion. And also hydrogen ion, the acid regeneration. So sulfur oxidizing microorganisms. So I mean, one of you asked about the uh, acid rock drainage. Acid rock drainage happens because there's a sulfur and then there's an oxygen and there's a moisture. So those three uh, recipe and then acid rock drainage happen. So why is an acid, uh, why acid produced in an acid rock drainage is because sulfur will be oxidized by this ferry and then it's gonna form sulfate and an acid. So literally, if you have a sulfur, a sulfur oxidizing microorganism produced sulfuric acid. So that's why uh, we have an acid rock drainage uh, problem. So sulfur, elemental sulfur again, oxidized to uh, form a sulfate. So this could happen, but it's very slow. But if we use the, uh, the specific microorganism, both reaction, iron, ferrous oxidation to ferric, and a sulfur oxidation to sulfate can be, I mean, improved like a thousand times faster. So that's why we use this uh, microorganism in the uh, system. And how do we use this uh, technology, bioleaching, biooxidation? So the leaching agent in the process are regenerated, as I said, leading to less chemical addition. So we don't need to. Uh, keep adding sulfuric acid or some other organic acid that we can produce by microbial activity. So the environmental advantage, provide a route to uh, handle lower grade material. I mean, you guys learned about the mineral processing and Professor Spillo always said, ton is wins, right? Tons win, but also great wins. If you have a high grade, I mean, uh, uh, a lot of a tonnage, you always win. But uh, Sometimes low grade material is very difficult because we have to I mean, spend some money. So operating cost is pretty high, then low grade material doesn't make any profit. But uh, using biotechnology, we can treat the uh, low grade material. <clears throat> and provide a route to handle materials containing some damaging elements such as arsenic and selenium and other material. So if you have a, for one example, if you have an arsenic in a copper concentrate, if you send it to the smelter, you're gonna get uh, some penalty fines. And using bio uh, process, we can treat those concentrate. And at the same time, we can also go around the uh, toxicity of the arsenic. So that's uh, one of the options. And ALD, rock drainage is a result of a bio, uh, bio leaching, bio oxidation of sulfide. And it's an immense challenge. We spend in a year globally spend more than a billion dollars to treat the acid rock drainage. So bio leaching is study uh, to improve the bio microbial activity to oxidize the sulfide and at the same time extract and recover metal. So if we know the mechanism more clearly, then we can find the way to uh, to avoid the acid rock drainage also. So. That's why the microbiologists uh, study about the uh, uh, acid rock drainage. <clears throat> so role of microbes, uh, I think it's a, a similar uh, slide. So metal sulfide oxidized and produced metal cation and ferric ion oxidized metal sulfide produced ferrous ion and a ferrous ion oxidized to ferric by ion oxidizing microorganism and then also sulfur uh, reduced uh, sulfur produced from this sulfide and a sulfur oxidizer uh, oxidized to sulfate and at the same time produced uh, sulfuric acid. So that's a, a very simple one slide explanation about the bio leaching, bio oxidation. And as I said, this iron oxidizing, sulfur, sulfur oxidizing reactions could happen naturally, but very slow. But, uh, but with the uh, microbial action, we can increase the uh, kinetics almost a thousand times. All right, so as I, I mean, we talk about the bio leaching, bio oxidation. So we use a special microorganism that naturally, most of them naturally occurring microorganism. Uh, this is a little, a little bit of a chemistry. So we need a two things, very important 
uh, nutrients, the carbon and an energy source. So we need to provide a carbon and there are two possibilities, one from uh, the uh, simple compounds such as a carbon dioxide and one from the uh, organic substance. So if the uh, microorganism take the carbon from CO2, we call the autotrophs, but if it takes from the, uh, the complex organic substance, we call the heterotrophs. So the two different things uh, based on the carbon source, they, how do they uh, utilize the, how do they access the carbon? And then also energy source, the three possibility, get the energy from the light, get the energy from organic molecules, get the energy from inorganic molecules. So most microorganisms that we are using is autotrophs, so they can get the uh, carbon from the CO2, and they can get, and then in terms of energy source, they can get the, uh, the energy from inorganic molecules, such as, I mean, one example is uh, ferrocyanin. So it's a chemorhizotroph and an autotroph. So chemorhizotroph, Autotrophs are commonly used for uh, bio leaching. And then let's quickly check what kind of microorganisms that we use. There are three different, I mean, three categories. So the first one we call mesophile. So mesophilic bacteria. And the mesophiles, they are really active, like uh, the temperature between 20 degrees Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius. And these are the name of the bacteria. So commonly used one, the first one, acetylthiobacillus ferrooxidans. So acid means they like an acid. Thiobacillus is a name. Thio it means sulfur. Bacillus is the shape like a, this uh, long uh, cigar shape. And ferrooxidans. Ferro means iron. Oxidants is an oxidizer. So that means they are in an acidic conditions. They uh, looks like a, a long uh, cigar shape, and they oxidize the iron. So that's the name of a, a microorganism. And then they also acetylthiobacillus thiooxygen. So same except the thio. Thio means sulfur. So acetylthiobacillus thiooxygen is a sulfur oxidizing microorganism. So those are the two uh, microorganisms that we use a lot. And then there are acetylthiobacillus caribus. Leptospirillum and also archaea. It's a different microorganism. So uh, that's a uh, 20, I mean, in a close to room temperature, they can populate themselves and grow and uh, oxidizing iron and sulfur. So this is actually the scanning electron microscope image. So scale bar is hard to read. So that's one micron. So from here to there, that's about a one micron. So the thickness is about one and the length is several microns. So where do we find it? This is uh, just one uh, photo so of acid rock drainage. You can see that uh, uh, red color solution coming out of, uh, from the uh, abandoned mine site. So why is red? Because iron oxidized. So you have a rust and an oxidizing iron, <clears throat> the color is going to turn red. So that's why we have uh, this uh, red color on that. And the next one is moderate thermophile. So as you can guess by the, uh, the name, it's a thermophile, it's like the uh, heat. So the, the uh, temperature range they really like is about uh, 42 up to 45 degrees Celsius. And as you can see in this figure, this photo, it's a little bigger. So moderate uh, thermophiles is a little bigger than the mesophile. And then, uh, there are different uh, names. So essentially they are doing similar things. So iron oxidizing, sulfur oxidizing. So that's a, a moderate thermophiles. And the next one is extremely thermophilic archaea. So it, sometimes you call it just a thermophile. So temperature range they really like is about a greater than 55 up to just, uh, I mean, 95 degrees Celsius. So those are the name, uh, Metallospera cedula, and then also the other one that we use a lot, Sidianus uh, brylii. So this name by the uh, professor, Bry uh, Dr. Briley. So uh, he found and uh, uh, he studied a lot. So they, I mean, one of the microorganisms was named by his, uh, his name. So these are the actual SEM image. It's a little different. So the mesophile and the moderate thermophile, 
is like a rod shape, <clears throat> but this one is actually, this is SCM image. Uh, this is a flat <clears throat> substance, and you can see this uh, sphere, round shaped sphere, that's actually uh, the microorganism. And then this is the uh, uh, optical microscope image that actually I took. So that little tiny one, that's a IKEA. So it's a, the shape is <clears throat> uh, different. So extreme thermophiles, uh, uh, very important in a certain mineral. So in a lower temperature, mitophile or moderate thermophile, there's a limit, but in a high temperature, if you, if you use these extreme thermophiles, we can take advantage of the high temperature and also they can do something much better than uh, the mitophiles or moderate thermophiles. So where does the uh, thermophiles come from? As you can guess, this is photograph, one photo, in a Yellowstone hot springs. So uh, Yellowstone and some burning coal tip in the United Kingdom and some uh, very specific place. So uh, the temperatures range uh, 70, 80, and it, it's pretty acidic. So you sometimes you heard about a, a, I mean, tourists fall into the uh, hot springs and I mean, they die, right? Sometimes. I think it was a few months ago they found that it's like a boots close to the, uh, uh, the hot spring in the Yellowstone. So anyway, uh, there are a few places that we can find this extreme thermophile. So as I said, mesophiles, moderate thermophiles, uh, we can find most of the uh, I mean, naturally occurring <laughs> microorganisms. So we can find everywhere. So those microorganisms are, I mean, you can, find everywhere. That's why acid rock drainage happens. But uh, this extreme thermophiles, only a few places uh, we can find. Okay, and then is it really important, particularly commercially important? So using microorganism, I mean, how much uh, copper or how much gold we can produce using this technology? So approximately 15%. Roughly 2.3 uh, million tons or 3 million tons per year, the copper produced uh, by this uh, bio leaching component. And the copper production by bio leaching is growing at the uh, high percent point per every year. So it's kind of uh, going up. And then, even if, I mean, one example is the Freeport Mangmoran's operation in Safford. So, Safford operation is mining, crushing, uh, agglomerating, and a heat leaching, if you understand what I'm saying. So they don't have any mill, so it's a heat leaching operation. Their copper recovery is around 85% or higher sometimes. And do they use bio process? Yes and no, because they don't uh, add any microorganism in their heat, but they provide the, uh, the better condition uh, for the microorganism grow well inside the heap so they can take advantage of this uh, microbial activity. So they don't, we call that, <clears throat> they don't add a microorganism, but as I said, those microorganisms are naturally occurring. So instead of putting microorganism, but they can provide uh, the air, air blowing from the bottom of the heap and uh, provide the, uh, the nutrients so they can take advantage of the bio leaching, uh, the bio oxidation process. <clears throat> and then there are uh, some other uh, operations that actually grow those microorganisms on site and add to uh, uh, heat leaching operation. <clears throat> and in the gold operation, some gold produced from the refractory ore in the primary concentrate. Uh, not much, but uh, the countries like in, in, in Africa and in Australia, they, there are uh, quite a few uh, uh, bio-oxidation process plant for the uh, precious metal. And then uranium bio-leaching has been demonstrated and a cobalt, nickel, zinc bio-leaching productions emerging because cobalt commercially recovered by bio-oxidation or pyrite. And cobalt and the nickel, so cobalt is sometimes a byproduct of the nickel operations, and the cobalt concentration is really, really low, like a one-tenth of a concentration of the nickel. And then we can 
produce with a very complicated flow sheet. And then if you can use this biotechnology and then uh, extract the uh, cobalt and the nickel and the manganese, those are, uh, I mean, those make a whole process uh, economically, <clears throat> I mean, profitable. So uh, the future for the bio oxidation, bio leaching is, I can say, very good. <clears throat> and then uh, for the copper, dump leaching, copper sulfide, the marginal ore, less than 0.15% or run mine ore. We usually, we call this the waste dump. Sometimes we call the waste dump. I hate that, I hate that term waste. It's a low grade dump. So you sprinkle the sulfuric acid solution and then sometimes you cannot even get 10% out of it and the overall recovery. But uh, if you advance this uh, biotechnology, we can get uh, much more <clears throat> copper out of those uh, low-grade runomine dump. And a heat leaching secondary copper and a sulfitic refractory gold, as I said, sometimes we crush. We crush up to, I mean, not up to, about a one and a half inches or sometimes pretty close to a half inch side and then agglomerated and then placed onto a leach pad and then we can extract. And then in that case, because we crush, agglomerate, and place on the pad, the recovery should be better. Better be around 85% or even higher. And then also the other way, other one is uh, using continuous stir tank reactor, CSTR, or sometimes we just call it as STR. So this, this application is uh, using fine ground material, typically 80% passing 75 micron or uh, smaller, finer uh, grind size. So put it into a uh, similar to a leach tank, a big leach tank, an agitated leach tank. We apply the uh, uh, oxygen or air from the bottom to promote the uh, fast uh, reaction. So fine grind and a good control. So from dump, heat, and the stir tank, we have a better control as the particle size is smaller and also the, uh, the reactor is because the reactor is well designed. <clears throat> so, I mean, that's a brief uh, introduction about what's the uh, bio leaching and the bio oxidation. So you learn about the, uh, the microorganism itself. So I'll show maybe three different applications. The first one is upper arsenic sulfide bio leaching. So Cu2S, what is Cu2S? Calcocide, TUS is cobalite. CO3ASS4, that's an anarchite. So that's a primary copper sulfide. It's very difficult to uh, extract. <clears throat> so heat bioleaching application with a crushed and agglomerated ore. So we ran uh, this bioleaching test uh, when I worked for company, and then uh, the result was, uh, I mean, really good. So we built the uh, demonstration plan. So chemical analysis of the sample. <clears throat> Acid soluble copper, anywhere between 1.7 to 20, 21%. So that means if you use sulfuric acid, we can get only up to 21%. So we cannot run just an acid heat leaching because uh, cobalite, energite, a little bit of a calcopyrite, we know those are not really uh, <clears throat> soluble in the sulfuric acid. And a cyanide soluble, it's anywhere between 33 and 88%. Why do we do cyanide soluble in the copper? We use cyanide for gold extraction, right? And why do we test the cyanide soluble copper, uh, <clears throat> cyanide soluble assay for the copper? Because the cyanide does get gold. Oh. <laughs> so calcopyrite <clears throat> is not dissolving in cyanide. So if you have material, then you don't know, you know how much uh, the calcopyrite in there. So if you run the cyanide leach test, then if you have a high cyanide leach test, I mean, high cyanide recovery, that means you don't have much calcopyrite. But if you have a lot of calcopyrite, your cyanide soluble assay is gonna be really low. So this indicate calcopyrite could be, uh, I mean, small or sometimes I mean, uh, I mean, I would say the medium. So uh, 33 to 88% of a cyanide soluble. So there are some cyanide, I mean, the, the calcopyrite, but not a whole lot. And a quick leach test, 
using high concentration of acid. So this gives us sort of a thumbs up value, how much uh, copper we can get out of the heat engine. So that's a characteristic, as you can see, it's not easy to uh, extract the copper out of uh, I'm using sulfuric acid. And there are a little silver and just uh, about a one PPM uh, gold in there. And arsenic, as you can expect, because we have an arsenic containing copper sulfide, arsenic concentration, arsenic concentration is high. And we, we ran a column test. The column test is a simulation <coughs> of the heat leaching. So heat leaching is we mine it, we crush, we crush to uh, one and a half inches or three quarter inches, or sometimes uh, close to half inches, and then agglomerating an agglomerating drum and it placed on the leach pad, and they sprinkle uh, leach solution, and then we can get the uh, copper out. So that's a heat leaching. So in the column leaching, we can uh, simulate the, the heat leaching operation in the lab. So using about a 50 kilogram of three quarter crushed material in a six inch or eight inch diameter column. So we agglomerate with a micro, and uh, this is a nutrient solution, and add an inoculum, microorganisms, and a ferric iron, and then we run that for a long time. I mean, how many months or how many years we run a heat bleaching? Sometimes we run like a two years or even three years. So in the lab, I also run some of the column more than two years. So these are result. So first one is calcocide. Calcocide is secondary copper sulfide. It's easy to leach if you have a little bit of oxygen, such as a ferric iron. So if we can even put the uh, uh, calcocide with an oxide, if you can add a little bit of ferric. So as we can expect, uh, calcocide leach very well. So you can, I don't know, you can see this uh, x-axis. So this is a leach date. Uh, that one is 400. So we ran <clears throat> the column for more than a year. So extraction is pretty high and because calcocide is secondary sulfide. And the cobalite, cobalite is here in this material, there's a secondary cobalite and also a primary cobalite. And most of the cobalite that we had was a primary cobalite. So these are two different things. This one, I mean, all mixed up, but everything is good. But these two, I mean, we have two plots here, two curves here, we have two curves there. So the lower extraction, they represent lower temperature column. That we use mesophile, mesophile and moderate uh, thermophiles. At the room temperature, actually 35 degrees Celsius, not 35, about a 25 degrees Celsius. And the other two is, using extreme thermophiles that steer round shaped microorganism at the 65 degree Celsius. So the primary cobalite shows the better extraction when we use the uh, uh, high temperature microorganism. And then the other one is the energite dominant sample. So energite is primary copper sulfide. The behavior is similar to calcopyrite. So in a room temperature, even if you use a microorganism, the extraction isn't going to go over 20%. So that as you see here, for about a 200, 200, more than 200 days, extraction is about a 15%. But using specific high temperature microorganism, then we get almost uh, 95 or higher copper extraction out of those uh, primary uh, sulfide as, as an energy. So this is one. <coughs> Uh, plot, so I forgot to mention. So as you can see, this one, how long does it take? I mean, from here to about 150 days, from here to about uh, 170 days, extractions are hovering around 20%. So we had a really long uh, lag time. So we wanted to uh, improve the, uh, the overall kinetics. So as you can see at the uh, later stage, uh, even 60 days or less than 100 days, all <clears throat> the metal extraction using high temperature microorganism should start, I mean, literally going up from 20% to uh, 90%. So 
thermophile, extreme thermophilic conditions, and uh, mesophilic conditions shows two distinct difference in terms of uh, the copper extraction. So that's um, uh, one of the copper oxidation result, copper uh, bio bleaching. Yeah. Arsenic, yeah, where does the arsenic go, right? Yeah, <clears throat> so I didn't put that slide. Arsenic, so when you have, when we have copper, arsenic, and a sulfur, so all those three will be solubilized. Copper will be <clears throat> dissolved as a cupric ion. Sulfur will be come out and oxidized to eventually sulfate and produce acid. And how about arsenic? Arsenic will be dissolved. So it's gonna come as an arsenic three plus. AS3 plus, and because of a, we have a lot of a ferric ion in the solution, arsenic 3 plus will be oxidized to arsenic 5 plus. And then arsenic 5 plus will be reacted with a lot of a ferric ion in the solution and it's gonna form scorodite. So the arsenic will be dissolved, but precipitate as a scorodite. So it, we don't need to treat the arsenic in the solution. So that's one of the advantage of uh, this uh, uh, process. So I didn't finish. That's a good question. <clears throat> and the second one is about refractory gold ore bio-oxidation using stir tank. The so stir tank, if you remember, I said stir tank use the fine ground material in a, in a well-controlled system. The chemical analysis, the gold grade vary from 1.5 gram per ton to 4.2 gram per ton. And the sulfide sulfur was pretty low. I mean, 0.18% and 0.66%, the sulfide content is not high. I mean, in this sulfide content, we expect a pretty good cyanidation result. But somehow, this material, we had only 44% and a 75% gold extraction. So this is from the bottle of bleaching using uh, 75 micron crush. So 75 micron crush, you get 40%, 70% gold extraction. I mean, that's not good. So we have to improve the uh, uh, recovery. So uh, we run some tests using 80% uh, passing, 200 mesh sample, pH control, use mesophile microorganisms in the bio-oxidation run 28 uh, days. I mean, usually in a well, design well, uh, fully developed uh, plant, it takes only like a two or three days. But in the lab scale, <clears throat> we use a little higher uh, solid content. So it took a little longer, but it should be only two to three days. And a sulfide oxidation is anywhere between 40% and 70%. As I, can, as I said, <clears throat> this is the table, so the gray, and uh, all the extractions, it's 75% uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, as a baseline cyanidation becomes 92% after the bio-oxidation. And cyanidation of all the extraction, 43% becomes 89.9% after the bio-oxidation. And 48.9% sample, we can get 95% gold out of uh, 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 bio-oxidized material. So in a very short period of time, 28 days is long, but we can do it in a few days. So you can, we can improve 40%, particularly in this case, 40% uh, cyanide gold recovery. And, but I, it's ultimately we can get 90% out of uh, uh, this uh, refractory material. And why does that happen? So these are actually some, uh, uh, backscattered image of SEM. As you can see, uh, we have pyrite, a lot of pyrite. So darker image, darker area is pyrite and a little lighter area is arsenopyrite. So it has an arsenic in there. And then as you can see the arsenopyrite, it's sort of a in, inside of the pyrite matrix. So gold can associate, gold can be associated with a pyrite and a gold can be associated with an arsenopyrite. But the concentration in arsenopyrite is order of magnitude uh, higher uh, than the pyrite, sometimes 100 times or even higher. 
So if you have an arsenopyrite, that means there's a chance that the gold concentration in this arsenopyrite is much higher than uh, pyrite. So if you don't treat the arsenopyrite correctly, you're going to lose that the uh, uh, high amount of uh, gold. So that's a arsenopyrite is in the center, and this one is typical. We call it arsenopyrite rimmed around the pyrite grain. So the arsenopyrite is in the edge that contains higher gold uh, in the pyrite grain. And then this one is, this big grain is muscovite, it's a clay material. And we have a pyrite and arsenopyrite similar to this. And then also uh, uh, pyrite and arsenopyrite. This case, even arsenopyrite is inside the uh, pyrite matrix. That's why we had a lower cyanide uh, gold recovery, but after the bio-oxidation, uh, we, we, we were able to oxidize those pyrite and arsenopyrite and liberate and expose the gold grain for the downstream cyanide process. And the next one is going to be short. So <clears throat> as an example, I show you one about the copper and arsine is for the heat leaching. Heat leaching crush size, uh, it can vary from half inches to a couple of inches. So relatively uh, larger crushing size. And the second one about the gold is fine ground material, 80% passing 75 micron. But I mean, is that all anywhere between? So this one is the, between those two uh, extreme, the crush size, not like a couple of inches, not like a 75 micron. <clears throat> so this is the sand size rock bio oxidation. So we named as a sand farming. The whole ore, 80% passing uh, 0.6 millimeter. So we use this uh, uh, reaction uh, I mean cell. So in the cell, we put the uh, agglomerated ore. This is the actual uh, photograph of agglomerated ore and place in the, in the reactors and we provide the air and the solutions and we run this over a certain time and, uh, uh, and follow by the uh, cyanidation gold extraction. And agglomerated with the uh, bio uh, solution. I said about juice and microbiologist doesn't like it. <laughs> so that's a chemical composition of the sample. So gold grade is uh, number one, 2.7. Number two is 1.2. Uh, gram per ton. It's, it's not high grade, but I mean, not bad. Uh, <clears throat> one and two uh, gram per ton. Silver is a little bit, copper and an arsenic. As you can see, sulfide sulfur is 5% and a 5.6 and a 4.9. So those are the typical sulfide, uh, uh, sulfide grade in uh, refractory sulfidic gold ore. The one that in the case two, sulfide sulfur is less than 1%. And that's an unusual case. <clears throat> so that's why we did the mineralogical study. So we have a 5% uh, sulfide sulfur. And then baseline cyanidation, we can get only 25%, 32% extraction. But we have to improve the uh, old extraction. So we ran this sand farming bio-oxidation. It's a little longer. So we ran 44 days and 83, 83 days for uh, each sample. So after 44 days and then 83 days, uh, sulfide oxidation vary 60%, 85%, 68%, and 81%. So as it, I mean, the longer the, we run the test, sulfide ox, the more the sulfide oxidation. <clears throat> and the gold extraction, as you can see, it was only 30%, but after the uh, bio-oxidation is 80% and uh, even 90% and then 92%. So, uh, from 30% baseline cyanidation, we can get 90% uh, gold extraction. So compared to the second case, we ran only 28 days, right? And I said we can run in a plan only for two days, but this one took much longer because, because this one, the particle size is much bigger. So second case is a 75% on that 75 micron sample. So the kinetic is uh, relatively faster, but this one we use a coarser material and it's longer, but we can get uh, almost 90% uh, 
hold on will be just a simple uh, bio-oxidation test. So this is summary. Uh, <clears throat> these days, because of advanced technology and uh, microbiology and uh, measurement and uh, scanning electron microscope and even transmission electron microscopes, so a lot of, uh, I mean, cool uh, equipment so we can study in a detail. So we had a I mean, better understanding about the, uh, the system. How does the micro, uh, microorganism uh, stay inside the uh, heap or in a, in a tank? And also beginning to understand the mechanisms. All day, we believe, okay, so the box need to <clears throat> contact with the sulfide and they can chew up the rock. But I mean, it's not working. It's not, it doesn't work like that. So it's more like an indirect uh, mechanism. Bio microbial uh, activity is produced the ferric ion and oxidizing the sulfur to produce the acid. So we know that uh, uh, the box doesn't eat the rock. So we, 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 we know that, so we have better understanding, but uh, we, we have to uh, find out a lot more detail. And then uh, as a processing options, there are 22 secondary copper heat bio leaching operation globally. So in the US, there are a few, there are lots of uh, bio leaching plants in, uh, in the South America. So you guys uh, heard about the uh, uh, Labra and then also, what is the one, Freeport, big one in the Freeport in Arequipa. The Cerro Verde, they had a bio leaching operations and any other place, uh, they actually grow the microorganism, they inoculate the heat. And then two sulfidic refractory gold heat bio oxidation. So Newmont Tri, Barry Tri, and the company in, I think it's Bulgaria and Europe, they also uh, try the uh, gold bio heat operations. And Chijin Mine in China, they also <coughs> uh, demonstrate the uh, gold heat bio oxidation. And then there are 15 certain uh, bio leach plant. There's nothing in the uh, in the North America yet, but uh, in an Australia, Africa, and then in other country, there are uh, uh, gold bio oxidation uh, plant. And we still have a challenge. So elucidate uh, bio leach mechanism in all micro group, microbial groups. So we we kind of know better in the mesophiles. files. But in an archaea side, in an extreme thermal file, uh, we only know so much. So we have to uh, investigate a little bit more and then identify microbial assemblies in the heap. So some microorganisms stuck on the rock sometimes, or they can uh, free flow with the, uh, the solution. So more study need to be uh, uh, performed. And then also, uh, I've talked to uh, some Company, small company, they can they can use microorganism to extract the lithium uh, from the the clay, lithium clay, because lithium atoms sitting on the the uh, lattice of the uh, the clay. So they're using conventional method is very difficult. So we try to develop a, uh, a new uh, bio leaching process. So uh, I think I'm. This is the last slide. So. Uh, micro miner, we can send them to underground mine and extract the uh, the value metal without uh, chemicals or anything. So that's all I have, and thank you. And then I can answer any questions. Thank you. So I have a question. Okay. I have a question, Billy. Can you hear me? So if it is a heat leaching, water usage is about the same. So uh, the application rate of uh, the water, I mean, the, the chemical, the bio solution is same as the heat leaching, like 0 0.003 gallon per minute per square uh, foot. So uh, water usage is the same. And then also at the same time, we can recycle the water, I mean, exactly same as the, uh, the conventional heat leaching operation. Yeah. You mentioned that this uh, method is bio leaching and bio oxidation are like 50% acceptance in the industry. Is there any particular reason 
technical, economical, social, why this number is not higher? Is there any red flag to face with here? <clears throat> so for the heat leaching, low grade material, uh, there's a definite advantage of a uh, bio leaching. If you have a uh, sulfide and a low grade, bio leaching has an advantage. But let's say if you have a uh, copper concentrate, so uh, I don't know how much, let's say you need to, I mean, the material that you need to send it to the smelter. The smelter can process. Uh, how many tons? I don't know. Huge amount of material can be processed in a, in a smelter, but bio oxidation is a little slower, right? I mean, pressure oxidation, smelter, the reaction time is a matter of hours, but bio oxidation is a matter of days, sometimes a matter of months and a year. So, <clears throat> to deal with the uh, high value material, bio oxidation is not the way to go. So, it's a very niche market. Niche process, so it, it has to be uh, it has to satisfy the certain restrictions, so we can use um, uh, bio process. And then also um, for the gold industry, they sort of are reluctant to use a bio process because if they can upgrade a material by mineral processing, and then we can use uh, pressure oxidation and roasting, and then. Uh, produce, I mean, more metal because gold is, I mean, much higher value. So, uh, in the in the economic wise, sometimes it's very difficult to uh, uh, compete against the uh, conventional process. But as I said, if the uh, the conditions are well met, the bio process is one of the uh, good options. It's basically an instrumental return. Exactly. So then if you use it for like a, the critical earth elements, uh, those are like low grade, but it's a higher ton. Mm -hmm. Would it have a viable market for that? The better answer for the metallurgist is always, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, yeah, I had a meeting this morning uh, with the, uh, the, the rare earth project, particularly related to coal. So yeah, low grade material, and if we can find the the correct microbe, let's say uh, extracting rares from uh, the concentration in the in the rare, particular neodymium, praseodymium, is less than 100 ppm. So how do we extract? If we find the, the proper microorganism and the system, what are we going to use? Heat leaching or tank leaching, maybe not tank leaching because the operating cost is too much. But the one thing that we discussed is how about in situ leaching using microorganisms. So, I mean, different crazy ideas come up. So uh, we try to uh, make the overall process um, economic. So today I just talk about sulfide oxidation. Sulfide oxidation and we can produce sulfuric acid, but there are some microorganisms that produce the, uh, the alkaline chemicals that we can extract some metal. And there are some bio uh, process we can use to produce the, uh, like an ascorbic acid or some other uh, organic acid. So different uh, uh, mechanism of uh, microbial uh, reactions, we can have a different uh, different chemicals, different acid or different alkaline uh, lixivian, we can use the uh, uh, rare earth and extremely low uh, materials process. We can, I mean, a lot of people study uh, on that uh, subject. And then kind of like a follow-up question is, can we bioengineer a micro, uh, a microbe that's tailored specifically to certain elements? Right, yeah, yeah. So. I mean, as I said, I, I work with a couple of uh, uh, startup companies. So they are heavy duty microbiologists. They're way up there, they're knowledge. So they believe they can tweak, they can make a, some sort of a, a mutant, a mutated gene and uh, do some I mean, extraordinary things. So microbiologists uh, can alter the, uh, the microorganism to do something special. Yeah, that's uh, one possibility.
Uh, so the first one, you had uh, two types of bacteria. One was oxidation and one was for the iron ferrospheric change. Is, this, is there any study relating the concentration of both or how do you take into account that variable when you're doing like an experimental bio-leach? So the concentration of uh, ferrous iron and the concentration of sulfur, you mean? Yeah, because you know that there were two different bacteria, right? Yeah, sulfur oxidizing and iron oxidizing microorganisms. And, uh, so the concentration of microorganisms? Mm -hmm. Oh, there's and not much control. It? So we started with the, uh, let's say, same amount of sulfur oxidizing microorganism and iron oxidizing microorganism. And as the reaction goes, on their population chain. So in a, we, some people studied, how does the uh, microorganism population, so those strain change? In our first month, there are a lot more iron ox I mean, sulfur oxidizing microorganisms. And after a couple of months, there are much more uh, other microorganisms. So it changed. So that's, it's really a uh, really active system, not just uh, uh, maintained and stays, as we started or provided. So it's a really uh, change. I think it mainly because of the conditions. So if the sulfur oxidizing microorganism oxidize all those sulfur, and then they don't have much things to do. And then they became little dormant. And an iron oxidizing box tried to oxidize all those uh, ferrous to ferry, and then they can change. So, but yeah. they both depend on each other to make it happen. Uh, no, I don't think they depend on each other. So there's a separate uh, mechanism. So if you have a sulfur, then sulfur, sulfur, iron, sulfur oxidizing box are really active. If you don't have any iron to oxidize, then the iron oxidizing microorganism cannot populate themselves. Is passivation still a problem? If passivation is a chemical phenomenon. So if you use a uh, mesophile and produce the lot of acid, and produce a lot of uh, ferric iron, then that's a recipe for passivation. That's why cacopyrite bio leaching using mesophile isn't gonna work. So we have to use the extreme thermophile, high temperature extreme thermophile, and the same for the energite, which is primary sulfide. We use the uh, lower temperature microorganism, passivation happens, but high temperature microorganism, we can go around the passivation. So that's a big difference. Questions. Any other question? Can you hear me? We don't. We don't exactly know why we had a so long lag time but we tried to shorten that lag time and then we eventually uh, sort of a successful. So, deep, so how did we do that? We add a microorganism more frequently in the first stage. So they can, uh, I mean, increase in 60, 50 days instead of 150 days. And then during that time, we also observe the arsenic tox, arsenic. Uh, toxicity because arsenic dissolves and arsenic is very toxic not only to us but also to those microorganisms. So arsenic uh, remediations uh, has to be uh, um, That kind of behavior will be, uh, would be also occasionally related with the copper. If you have a lot of arsenic, yes, it could be. First question. So are you starting with an inoculum or are you starting with just naturally with it already? Like you set up your experiment. I started with inoculum and it grow those microorganisms in the lab in a larger scale. Okay, and then you add, then you yeah, and then I uh, yeah. inoculated using that. Uh, yeah. Objects, you know, yeah, yeah, and then, and then, um, and I was wondering, like, you're not so I'm a microbiologist, but 
but I also work on gold mining side, like a construction design. Um, but kind of like it, it all where I'm, where I'm doing mm -hmm. it. Uh, and so I'm curious, like, what has what have people done in terms of looking at the community dynamic? Yeah, I mean, this is like a batch reactor that you give it. You give it nutrients, but you're just putting it on and then you're exhausting all the it's, it's it's not a batch reactor because in a heat bleaching, the solution went through the heat and then we collect the solution at the PLS on and the solution went through uh, solvent extraction, electro winning, and then that acid solution raffinated coming back to raffinate on and it's going to go back to uh, the heat bleaching circuit. So it's not a batch. So okay. and the same for the stir tank, stir tank. Yeah. Keep going and it's coming back. It so, comes back. Yeah. But it's but it's just one input and then you're recirculating it. You mean in terms of uh, inoculum? Yeah. 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 We yeah, so it's some I mean when we start, uh, we have to inoculate and make sure it grows well. And if not, we add an inoculum again and again. Okay. But when it's steady state, yeah. it looks that curves so it. I mean, initial stage and exponential growth and depth. So they follow that that uh, profile, but also at the same time, they populate themselves so, so maintain the culture. Yeah, they're maintaining. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're just giving, it's an enrichment culture, essentially what you created. Um, has, anyone, oh, has anyone looked at these dynamics, these community dynamics throughout the entire extraction process, like sequencing? Uh, there are some people, I mean, in a microbiologist, they look at the, uh, the, the community, how does that change? And, and sometimes they do a DNA sequence and all those things. Okay, yeah. but, uh, it's not know. my job, but I mean, some microorganism, I mean, microbiologists actually uh, uh, perform that type of work. Okay. So in terms of like price, like which one costs most? Like, 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 the cost, you mean? Yeah. Uh, microorganism, as I said, it's naturally occurring. So I don't need to even buy that. I can go out to copper heat bleaching operation, get the solution, and I can grow in a, in a lab. So cost is nothing. But if you want to grow in a larger quantity, you have the big tank and agitations and first the air. So that's a little bit of a expense, but as I said, we grow the box in a larger quantity and we inoculate the huge heap, like maybe mile by mile and 10 meter, 20 meter heap. When we inoculate it and they will start running very well and we don't need to maintain that uh, the inoculum, so I call bug farm. We don't need to uh, maintain the, uh, uh, the inoculum tank so we can just Stop. So there's no additional cost in, compared to the uh, key adding sulfur gas. Yeah, I think that's the last question. Oh, is that right? Oh, calcium hydroxide is the pH control. Uh, chemicals uh, because after the bio oxidation we produce because we produce a lot of uh, sulfuric acid uh, the pH of the uh, the system is pretty acidic so to run a cyanide gold leaching we have to maintain the pH about 10.5 so we use a lime calcium hydroxide to uh, increase the pH and maintain the pH any other question? If not, I'm done. Okay, thank you very much. So